to our presentation this evening on understanding your grief after a drug overdose death. My name is Sheila Bourgeois. I am the Bereavement and Wellness Coordinator at Hospice Peterborough, and I'm pleased to be presenting with Alice Citrum tonight. Alice, can you introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm, my name is Alice Citrum. I'm one of the Victim Services Coordinators here at the Peterborough Police Service. And a lot of the work that we do in victim services is about collaboration and working with our community partners who have a lot more um, of these supports to offer our community and expertise. So honored to be presenting with Sheila tonight. So this is an overview of what we'll be touching on tonight. And I loved this image when I found it because um, you can see the horizon, but when you look through the orb that this person's holding in their hands, the whole world is turned upside down. And often that's what happens when we're grieving and particularly when we're grieving a sudden or traumatic death, which overdose loss is. Tonight, we're gonna have an opening where we'll have a mindfulness and a land acknowledgement. Then we'll touch briefly on Peterborough's op opioid crisis. And then we'll begin talking about grief following an overdose death. We'll talk about our people and we find it so important to acknowledge that our people are not their addiction. We'll talk about common thoughts and feelings you may experience in your grief journey, unique factors in grief following an overdose. We'll talk about grief and trauma and We'll also address why your grief may feel different from other people's grief or from other losses that you've experienced. We'll be sharing some research about the unique experience of parents. And then we'll finish up by talking about caring for yourself, finding hope, and then some additional resources that may be helpful. So we wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg. We offer our gratitude to our First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. We acknowledge that where we meet is the land and territory of the Anishinaabeg people. We gather with gratitude to our Mississauga neighbors. We say miigwech to thank them and other Aboriginal peoples for taking care of this land from time immemorial and for sharing this land with those of us who are newcomers. Out of that gratitude, we are called to treat the land, its plants, animals, stories, and its peoples with honor and respect. We are all treaty people. We acknowledge that the land on which Hospice Peterborough and the Peterborough Police is located is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga and is in the territory covered by Treaty 20. So we just want to touch on um, a few things before we move forward. One is confidentiality. We take your confidentiality very seriously. And just so you're aware, if you do post comments or questions in the chat box, it will have your name attached. If you would prefer to maintain total confidentiality, you are able to click, um, there should be three dots on your Zoom bar and you can rename yourself to a different name if you so choose. But also just a reminder to keep microphones and cameras off during the presentation to maintain your confidentiality. If questions do come up, as I say, we welcome them and please put them into the chat box and we have somebody who's joined tonight that will be bringing those to our attention and um, bringing them up at the end of the session. And then recognizing the weight of the topic we're discovering, sorry, we're discussing tonight. Um, we want to make sure that you know that we are here for support. So if you do find that this is something you're continuing to think about or feel overwhelmed about in the days to come, please reach out. We'll be providing our emails at the end of the presentation. Before we move um, into some content, um, I think it's important for 
um, all of us to sort of also understand who's coming here tonight, who, who is um, looking for some support or even just interested in opening that discussion about drug overdose grief. I want to get to know you a little bit better. It is anonymous, so we don't know who's answering these questions, just important to know. There's also options to um, choose not to answer if you don't want to do that. So I've put up a poll here. We'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that as best as you can, just so that we, Sheila and I have a better understanding that it's, especially with Zoom um, and webinars with Zoom, makes it much difficult, more difficult to know who's in the virtual room and who's here with us tonight. Just give it a few more seconds. Most of you have already voted or completed the poll. Okay, so we'll just end the poll there. And if you'll look up on the screen, you will see sort of the answers that we've collected. And um, Sheila and I, we've done a few of these of grief webinars and it's always nice to see people who are attending these, um, these sessions who are supporting someone who's grieving or who are interested for others reasons. I think that speaks to especially our community that we're trying really hard to build a more compassionate and more grief literate community around um, grief and loss, but especially traumatic grief and loss like overdose grief. And we also want to thank those of you who are grieving, who are making time and finding the energy to participate tonight, because we know that grieving can take a lot of energy and it's exhausting. Absolutely. So we're before again we get started into content, I think it's important to take a moment. We usually do a um, meditation um, and this is somewhat uh, that but it's also uh, different because mindfulness can be a quite challenging thing to do when we are dealing with a crisis and when I'm when I speak about crisis I'm talking about of course the opioid uh, epidemic and the opioid crisis that we have not only in our community but many many communities across this country and so that can feel really different when we're trying to make space for grief and loss and feelings, but we're also feeling a lot of other things like anger and helplessness and um, maybe even just exha exhaustion from feeling all of those things um, and fighting for people who are dying. So talk, we recognize, Sheila and I both recognize that talking about drug overdose grief is timely but it's also unsettling for many of us because we're still in the thick of that epidemic. People we love are dying every day from this. And although we need to make room for grief, we also are still dealing with the trauma of those losses. And this, what this does, it causes us to protect our hearts from truly feeling our grief. And we brace because we're bracing ourselves for that other, for that next loss or for that next death. And so for the next hour, let's try and create a little bit of space for that grief and for that, for that conversation. But we're also mindful that a lot of you are still dealing with the trauma. So you'll notice behind Sheila, there are some candles lit and we did that intentionally because it's a sort of a ceremonial um, gift to everyone who's come here with somebody who has died in their thoughts and in their hearts. Much of the work that hospice does is around honoring the person that has died. And we do that in different ways. One of those ways can be lighting a candle. It creates that um, space for that person in that room. And so if you'll just follow with me these words as we, if you want to light your own candle, if you have that beside you, you can do that. If not, take a look at the candles that are burning behind Sheila and the image before you. 
we acknowledge your grief journey has been complicated by an unexpected and untimely and stigmatized death. It will not be easy. Grieving this death will likely be harder than other deaths you have experienced, which makes the mourning harder too. Some refer to the mourning requiring of traumatic losses as heroic mourning. This idea is that if this grief feels bigger and more painful than other griefs you have suffered in your life, it will demand bigger and bolder expression too. Right now, we invite you to close if it feels right for you. And remember the person or persons who died. Picture them at their happiest and healthiest. Recall their special smile. Feel your love and care for them. That will never die. At this point, we invite you to, if you wish, to type the name, the first name or names of the person or persons who you're thinking of who've died of a drug overdose. If it does not feel comfortable for you to type their name or it doesn't feel right for you to type their name, you can say their name to yourself, whether it's out loud if you're muted or in your head. And we'll just give everyone a moment to do that. Thank you to everyone who has come here tonight with um, and bringing those people with you in your in your heart and um, having the bravery to say their name and the courage to say their name. That is a very difficult thing to do um, when we're grieving, especially when we're grieving this death. So when we recognize when we're talking about drug overdose death that it's it can be very difficult to talk about that, in fact, impossible without giving it context with the crisis that we're dealing with in our community. And so we're just briefly going to talk about that because being able to talk about the context of how someone has died is important. It's important to our abilities to uh, properly grieve that person and how they died. It's especially important when we're talking about traumatic grief and traumatic death. The crisis has left people feeling overwhelmed with sadness, but also with anger because this death feels especially preventable. There's overwhelming feelings of hopelessness in the midst of a crisis, one death after another. Many communities still look at overdose as the overdose crisis as a stigma in a stigmatized way, instead of using harm reduction lens that can have an impact on how we talk about our grief. It makes the fight even more lonesome and more isolating. The language we choose when we talk about drug overdose and drug overdose deaths can affect how we think and feel about our person's death and about ourselves as mourners. The circumstances of our person's death and how we are able to talk about it has a direct impact 
who are suffering related to drug poisonings. Sorry, I have a time on my lighting in my office and I did not think that it would go off, apologies. Being able to talk about overdose addiction and grief is crucial to our ability to mourn. If we aren't able to have that conversation with people, how are we able to grieve them? We, are, we need to be able to talk about all circumstances of drug overdoses, including people who have rec recreational use from people who are relapsing to people who are intentionally poisoned. All of those circumstances matter. All of those people matter. And all of them are welcomed in this discussion. We also need to be able to talk about cumulative loss and how that impacts our grief. So cumulative loss for anyone who's not heard of that term before is the loss is a loss refers to the experience of suffering a new loss before you have the chance to grieve your first loss or suffering multiple losses in quick succession seen that or we've had that experience for sure when we're talking about the overdose and opioid overdose crisis but also now in the context of covid and how that has impacted our feelings around cumulative loss we're hearing about death all the time every day and that has an impact on us whether we know that or we feel that So I have this picture, we have this picture up of the, our, of the brain, of the human brain, and I just want to briefly touch on addiction. I am not an addictions counselor and I don't work directly with addiction, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. That being said, I think it's important to be able to talk about addictions in the context of grief, because how we talk about addictions and the language we use has a direct impact on our ability to really openly talk about our grief in the context of an overdose death. When we look at addictions, we think about a biological response to a stimulus. It is not a innate flaw. It is not a weakness of the person. It is a biological response that we all have. What we know about addictions is that there are risk factors to, to being becoming addicted, such as trauma or biology, biological factors, environment. However, that doesn't change the fact that our brains are going to react the same way to a stimulus such as a drug, especially a very highly addictive drug. I once read this quote uh, talking about addiction as addiction is derived from the Latin term for enslaved by or bound to. And that really um, helped me solidify my understanding and my ability to, to feel compassion around the word addiction. Anyone who has struggled with addiction addiction or had to overcome addiction or has tried to help someone else do those things understands those words enslaved by or bound to addiction we need to start looking at addiction as a chronic disease that changes both brain structure and function just like cardiovascular disease damages the heart and diabetes impairs the pancreas addiction hijacks our brain. Addiction, addictive drug, oh, sorry, Sheila. I'm sorry, I jumped. No, it's okay, I had a bit of a pause. Sorry, you guys, we're still uh, 
sometimes we, we do that to each other. Addictive drugs provide a shortcut to the brain's reward system by flooding the part of our brain with a neurotransmitter called dopamine. So basically what that means is our brains do not have a way to withstand that onslaught from that addictive drug. We go back to its roots, enslaved by or bound to that reward system. And so just to close that discussion on addiction, it, if any one of you have had people say um, uncompa uncompassionate or unkind things about addiction or about your person's addiction, that's because we still have a lot of work to do on, on unlearning some of the, that stigmatized language. And that definitely has an impact on how we're able to talk about it, or if we feel like we have the right to talk about it. Okay, Sheila, next one. Grief work is prevention work. And what do we mean by that? Because prevention work is crucial and critical to addressing the opioid overdose crisis. But how does grief work play a part in that? And if we think about what addiction does, what is the purpose of addiction? Addiction is to numb pain, whether that be emotional pain or physical pain. Addiction is to avoid pain. And when we talk about pain, we're also talking about loss, whether that be death related loss or a death, a non death related loss or a death loss. And so when we're doing grief work, especially around this issue, or any kind of loss, what we're doing is we're letting people know that having those feelings of pain and loss is normal, natural, and can be talked about and should be talked about. And so if we are able to talk about our grief, we are doing prevention work so that people don't feel they have to numb, avoid, or never talk about their pain. So we're going to share a video. Alice, maybe while we're sharing the video, I can hear your partner in the background there. Alice has a support dog named Pixie, who she mentioned had a bone and we couldn't hear prior to starting the session, but I, some of you may have heard the noise of Pixie enjoying that bone in the background. Um, we're going to share some videos with you throughout the presentation this evening. And um, this is a video from Christian. Christian is somebody who works in the Peterborough area it, with people living in poverty, dealing with homelessness and dealing with addiction. And this is Christian's thoughts on um, our people. And he does, Christian has a deep spirituality and he speaks of God in this, this message, but I think it's something that's very powerful for everyone to hear. If you've lost someone uh, as a result of the opioid crisis, a result of an opioid overdose or any sort of overdose, um, what I, th I, th I think we need to hold on to is that the person you lost is not the addiction. So often we want to define someone by that tragic event and that doesn't define who they are. They're so much more than that. They are that beautiful person that you love, that you cared for, that brought you joy, that brought you pain. They were all those things and, and we so often want to define them as a junkie or, a, or an addict, but they're more than that and hold on to that piece. Hold on to the fact that they are a whole person with beauty, they have the face of God within them and to hold on to those things. Sorry. If, if you... So we also have some quotes from people who have experienced an overdose death. And this is from a young man who experienced the death of his dad 
And he said, I didn't want anyone to think that just because he was an alcoholic and just because he died young doesn't make him a bad dad. He was a fantastic father. And I wanted people at the funeral to know how special he was to us. And Pauline Boss, who's done a great amount of work in the field of grief and in particular overdose grief, talks about closure and how it's a terrible word in human relationships. Once you've become attached to somebody, love them, care about them, when they're lost, you still care about them. It's a different dimension, but you can't just turn it off. So in this video, we're going to hear from Krista and we'll hear from Krista a couple more times this evening. And she experienced the death of her son to an overdose and has some sh thoughts to share with you. These are all from a website called Grief Stories, which we include in our resources at the end. But here's what Krista had to say about feeling your grief. Well, like I said, like with my mom she'd rather not talk about it and not you know bring it up and then yeah my sister and she's like my mom and uh it's just so many different personalities and um you know some people want to talk about it and feel it helps and other people i think think talking about it will bring up feelings they don't want to feel and um I think that we need to feel those feelings, those uncomfortable feelings that nobody wants to feel in order to grow and move past and move forward from this tragedy is what it is. And uh, like I said, just move on, if you can move on from something like this. So one thing before we move to the next slide that I wanna to touch on is Krista talks about moving on. And that's actually something that doesn't really fit with grieving because moving on gives us the idea that we're leaving our person behind as we move forward. But moving forward with your person is more of what it is because your grief continues and you learn to carry that grief, but your person isn't any further behind because they've helped shape who you are and the experience. And so you move forward with them as opposed to moving on from them. So I just wanted to clarify that because that can sometimes um, strike a chord with people. Oh, this is not, sorry about this. There we go. So here's a long list of things that you may feel or think or experience in your grief journey. And I'm gonna touch on a few of them and then we'll be touching on a few others throughout the presentation. But the first one I want to address is fear and anxiety. And that can often be, it's a very common experience, especially after a traumatic loss, because this blindsides you. As much as you may have had a challenging journey with your person and worried that this could be the end result, nothing can prepare you for that phone call or that door. And so with being blindsided by this loss, it's also natural to feel anxiety because it undermines your sense of safety and security in the world. The other piece of anxiety can sometimes come from the fact that when you're grieving, your thoughts can become very disorganized and it can be very difficult to fo focus. And sometimes people may believe that they're experiencing a mental health event or crisis. Um, but to make sure that you recognize that often those disorganized thoughts are a normal part of the grieving process. Guilt and regret can be so common, especially with overdose death, as people think about things that they did or didn't do, things that they said or didn't say. And all of those if onlys are so normal and so natural even though the death was not your fault and it wasn't something you could control. I wanna to touch on the experience of release and relief. And much of what we're sharing tonight will, is 
um, from a resource that we'll also share with you at the end, um, written by Alan Wolfelt. And he writes that often after an overdose loss, you may feel that for the first time in a very long time, you're able to take a breath. And sometimes with that sense of relief, you may feel guilt for feeling relief that your person has died, but it doesn't mean that there's a lack of love. It just means that you've been walking a very difficult path of hardship and heartache and relapses and close calls. And there can be a sense of relief that that is no longer the way that you have to live and you can breathe for the first time in a long time. I also wanna to touch on some of the physical, cognitive and spiritual symptoms that you may experience. So physically, you may notice your body is just generally more uncomfortable. You may be having less sleep. You may not have the appetite that you did. You may be experiencing weakness and exhaustion. You may be more susceptible to illness and may have stomach or chest pains. And certainly it can be valuable to have a check-in with your family doctor if, if you are experiencing a number of physical symptoms. Cognitively, you might have difficulty concentrating. Focusing may be a challenge. People talk about wanting to be able to just sit down and watch a 20 minute sitcom, but not have the ability to concentrate or focus for even 20 minutes. You may find that you struggle to complete simple tasks. And sometimes you may find that your short term memory is struggling a little and that's okay. That's part of grief. Spiritually, you may struggle with questions of faith. You may question the meaning of life. You may be thinking a lot about the possibility of an afterlife. And it is also common to experience despair or purposelessness following an overdose death. And then also we wanna to touch on the effects on the family. It's when multiple members of the family are all grieving, it's a shared grief, but you're all grieving in your own unique way and giving each other space and patience to allow for that is so important as you go through this journey. Everybody in the family has a high need for support and a low capacity to be supportive. So reaching out to friends, groups, and counselors for additional support when you aren't able to support one another. So some other experiences that were shared about grief following an overdose death is, this is a daughter saying, when she first died, it was a relief that it was over. It's difficult because you feel guilty for feeling like that. You think it's wrong to have feelings like that. It took me a while to realize I had the right to be upset. And then another daughter said, I was also grieving for the father I had never had, at least when he was alive, even when he was being absolutely awful, there was always this tiny bit of me that thought, well, maybe one day I'll get the dad that everyone else gets. And then another daughter said, I lost my mom when this started. I always hoped I would have my mom back. So I grieved the loss of my mom. And then I have a second grief for the person she became with her addiction. So we're going to move into some of the unique factors that um, to grief after an overdose, overdose death. And none of this is going to be new to anyone reading these words on the screen, but I think it's important to sort of um, look at them a bit closer. And what is it about those things that make overdose grief so difficult? Um, there are reasons and circumstances that give rise to these complicated emotions and feelings that you're having. Overdoses and addictions is still associated with a tremendous amounts of shame and stigma. There are confusing and diametrically opposing feelings that come up like blame and then relief 
there's trauma associated to overdose deaths, interactions with systems by family and friends of the person who's died create layers of secondary trauma and victimization. And it's further complicated if those interactions with systems were, were not good to start with. So before your person died, you may have had interaction with systems like hospitals, like police, um, like uh, service providers who, like Sheila pointed out, might not have been able to share a lot of information with you that left a, um, a difficult, fe difficult feelings around those systems and how they, um, how they interacted uh, with, your, with your family prior to the death and even after. There are many unanswered questions that are left for family and friends to deal with. The whys of traumatic death are one that we will touch on later, but some will remain a why and some you may get answers for. Waiting for autopsy results to know the cause of death and what toxins or poisons were in your person complicates our ability to mourn and to accept the reality of that death. Circumstances around the overdose um, death, like we touched on before around whether it was an accidental poisoning, intentional poisoning, or taking too much of a substance, all impact our grief. It leaves family and friends feeling like the death was preventable. And there isn't a lot of talk on harm reduction. How family and friends talk to you and the words that they use when they're talking about the per your person and how they died impacts our grief. And how media reports on overdoses and overdose deaths impacts our grief. When we see numbers being reported, when we see stories about overdose deaths one after another, again, it's like an inoculation of trauma exposure. It's all, so much of it for so long. It impacts our grief. And just to further that comment about why does overdose grief feels so different. The image you have up on the screen is based on a grief theory on the needs of mourning, the six needs of mourning. And if you look at some of those needs and we talk about accepting the reality of the death and how difficult that is when we're talking about an overdose death, um, being able to let yourself feel the pain of the loss and even letting others help you now and always. And when we're talking about overdose grief in the, in the context of having difficulty with accepting the feelings around blame or shame, and then not knowing who to talk to about it or feeling like you can't because the reactions or the comments that are made are unhelpful or unkind or not understanding of addictions and trauma can make us feel like we don't have a right to talk about our grief and therefore mourn it. It's important to distinguish the difference between grief and trauma response when we're talking about overdose grief. This is an image that we'll see in the next slide that breaks down a little bit more what that means. So when we're talking about grief response and traumatic response, they're very two different things on every level from cognition to how we feel in our bodies to even just how we think about the world. So if we think about grief as this um, process of yearning and missing our person and that lost relationship, and then if we, on the flip side, trauma is about focusing on the event how our person died and how difficult and challenging that can make it for us to actually grieve our person. In grief, we're reliving their absence. In trauma, we're reliving the event. In grief, some of the affect that we most 
know about grief is things like sadness and separation anxiety. Also much easier to talk about sadness than talk about fear or horror or anxiety that we see when we're talking about trauma. Our belief when we're dealing with a grief or a loss that's not traumatic is how can I go on? Who am I now? We're talking about meaning making and continuing bonds. In trauma, we're talking about why did this happen? Can it happen again? Mem the memory associated to grief is about, we, we look at memory as we reminisce about our person. We want to be close to our grief and close to our person. In trauma, the memory of the, of the event is about avoidance and those intrusive memories or intrusive thoughts. And sometimes for, for some of us, it's about intrusive imagery if we were there when our person died. And the symptoms around grief, we look at depressive symptoms like sadness um, with trauma. We're looking at hyperarousal, hypervigilance, and then also numbing when those things are too much to cope with. This quote um, I liked, it's by C.S. Lewis. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. And what he's talking about there is that um, relating the feelings around fear to grief. So that feeling of the butterflies in our stomach our heart racing, um, maybe we feel disoriented in our minds, maybe our palms are sweaty, um, that those same symptoms and feelings in our bodies come up with grief, especially traumatic grief, when we don't know what's going to happen next, when our world views or assumptions have been shattered. The next few slides are gonna talk about some of the important pieces to overdose, uh, drug overdose loss. And so the first one we're gonna talk about is stigma, isolation, and shame. And there is a video later on uh, from Krista that she talks a little bit about uh, some of that as well. But I like this quote again. So this is by Sandy Swenson and she um, does some work with uh, moms and um, started a group around supporting other moms who are um, dealing with a, a child who's suffering from an addiction. And really, she is so wonderful. Her words are beautiful when around destigmatizing language around addiction um, and mental health. But she says, maybe letting go with love means letting go of silence. And um, I love that quote. So she, which what stigma does is that not only has someone that you cared about died, but others avoid you or make you feel ashamed about the death. You feel in yourself that maybe your thoughts and feelings about drug overdoses make you feel uncomfortable about sharing the cause of death with others. And that's a normal and natural response to that stigma. Others may also assume that you don't wanna talk about it or be reminded of it because it's too difficult to talk about or it's too challenging or will bring up some uncomfortable feelings, sort of what Krista brought up in that video earlier. So what does that do to us as mourners? We're reluctant to openly discuss the cause of death. We're reluctant to participate in support groups or counseling. And we're hesitant to seek support from friends and family members because of what they might say and sometimes what it might bring up as well. The shame and blame piece, really important just to quickly touch on that, important to distinguish the difference between shame and blame. Shame being how you see yourself um, and how you see the person who died after the drug overdose. Blame is one, one that you did something bad um, and the shame piece is belief that you are bad. And both of those pieces place are, uh, are definitely held, held beliefs around drug overdose grief. 
So how do we address stigma? Um, it's not an easy, that's not an easy question to answer. But what I can say is we, we start ending stigma by sharing our story and having others listen to our story and accepting the differences that may exist. Being able to talk about addiction, being able to openly talk about overdoses, not just in small little communities or niches, but as a society, as a whole community and being able to tell our story. Overdose, drug overdose grief um, is a disenfranchised grief. And what does that mean? So gr disenfranchised grief is a term that's used to describe um, a grief that isn't socially or publicly acknowledged, that the manner of the death is stigmatized. The person who's grieving may not be recognized as a griever. So if you lost somebody like a friend or a classmate or a neighbor that you were close to, to an overdose, and you aren't being recognized as somebody who is also grieving. The relationship has no legitimacy. Again, especially we see this a lot with people with lived experiences who are also struggling with their maybe their own addiction who have lost friends, close friends to, a, to an overdose, but aren't able to publicly grieve them. We also see disenfranchisement happening with parents and family members where because it was an overdose, they're being told, well, shouldn't you have seen this coming? Or other horrible things like, well, what did you expect? They were an addict. Again, once again, silencing our, our voices to be able to talk about that loss and that grief. The relationship with your person prior to their death is important in the context of your grief. There's a lot of feelings and potentially unfinished business when it comes to that relationship. Things that you never did, things that never got you never got to say, things you wish you hadn't said, the if onlys that come up when you're grieving. And so there's a lot of guilt that's associated to overdose drug overdose deaths because of the relationship prior to the death. There might have been periods of time where you didn't speak to your person because of the challenging situation they might have been in or that you might have found yourself in. The relationship might have been strained or you might have been actively trying to get them into rehab. There's a huge spectrum of of experiences that you could have had with your person that impact how you see your grief and whether you acknowledge that you're even allowed to grieve. There's some quotes here that we pull, I pulled out of um, some research in the States when they um, interviewed parents um, and siblings after an overdose death. This is a sibling saying, because actually he had been gradually leaving us for a long time. And he's talking about um, his sibling prior to the death and that feeling of ambiguous loss of not having a physical relationship with the person, um, or sorry, not having a psychological relationship with the person, but maybe they were physically there, but psychologically distant because they were dealing with an addiction um, and mental health concerns. This is a parent saying, I did for him what I could and even what I couldn't. Talking about that feeling of hope, but also helplessness too, 
there's a quote here from another bereaved parent. I tell you what, the drugs don't just take the addicted person. It takes everybody right down the toilet with them. The emotional toll of living with the addiction for as long as you do and having hopes and having hopes and when they die, the hopelessness you feel because you couldn't make them stop. It's really tough. So we have another video from Krista. So the way um, I found in our family structure of dealing with the loss of a loved one from opioid overdose, um, well, I have my way of dealing with, of it, with it, which is to talk about it and bring awareness and educate people about it. And then my mother, for example, she kind of would like to be off to the side and let's not talk about it and let's, you know, kind of hide our family secret and, and not talk about it and not bring it up. But who's that going to help? I'm, I'm telling my, my story so I can help somebody else. I don't want my son's life. I don't want his death to be in vain for nothing. So, sorry. So the way um, I found an our So it, it beautifully kind of ties into this idea of meaning making or meaning reconstruction. Um, when Krista talks about what she feels she needs to do um, or what she can do to make meaning of this tragedy. And that is one of the most challenging parts to grieving an overdose death. Meaning making or meaning reconstruction is not something that happens right away. It's also not something that happens once or in a short period of time. It is a lifelong exploration of, the, of ourselves and how we make meaning of such a tragedy and traumatic incident in our families or in our lives. There are lots of reasons why meaning making is so challenging for families, especially when dealing with a traumatic death like an overdose. But one of the things that meaning making does is it makes us think about how can I continue to honor the life of the person who died? What can I do now? questions like how can I help prevent this from happening again and how can I become a more loving compassionate and helpful person as a result of this tragedy some of you are probably thinking that's I can't even think of that those things right now and that's completely okay where you are at in your grief is exactly where you need to be but that meaning making is something that is part of mourning and can create a lot of challenges for folks. The biggest thing that came out of some of the research around interviewing parents um, and families was they got, they received meaning making or were able to look into meaning making once they met other people who were also grieving an overdose death. Once they were able to talk about it with other parents, with other siblings, with other friends who also lost someone to an overdose and finding your community. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the unique experience of parents. But before I um, start with this, I just want to acknowledge that we will likely be going a little bit over our time um, that we had hoped to wrap up, which is 730. But I also know that there is some discussion happening in the chat room. And so we will be sticking around if you're able to stay with us. If you do need to leave right at 730, this will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel in about a week on the Hospice Peterborough YouTube channel. So um, the unique experience of parents after an overdose loss uh, was looked at in a recent, it was a 2020 study that came out last year. Um, sorry, of course it came out last year, it was 2020, called The Sounds of Silence, The Special Grief of Drug Death Bereaved Parents. And this happened, um, took place in Norway, and it was interviews with 14 parents. 
and they looked at the themes that were present for each of the parents. And so the, the most, the biggest themes that presented were a sense of constant preparedness. And so it, parents talked about constantly being on alert or worried about their child or ready to jump when the phone rang and they needed help. Um, constantly worried about a phone call that would tell them that their child had died. So that's a very universal experience. One of the things that I found really interesting is parents talked about having a sense of responsibility, but being unable to take action because their children were adults and had rights to confidentiality with the supports that they were accessing. And so parents would want to reach out to these supports, but not be able to to do much because of the confidentiality piece. Um, so that sense of responsibility, but not being able to take action. Stigmatization um, was a theme that was present in two areas. So there was the social stigma, the feeling that um, people perceived drug addiction is a lifestyle or a choice that people have, um, and a lack of professional consideration for their child's wishes and needs that professionals didn't hear, truly hear and listen to their child. And then the per parental self stigma of feeling shame and guilt and that they didn't do everything they could to protect their child. The next theme was emotional overload. So just so many intense feelings. Um, and really on top of grieving their child, grieving the life that their child was never able to have, the life they had hoped for them. And also finding purpose was another part of the emotional overload piece that often, not often, but sometimes parents um, caring for their child who was dealing with addiction had been a full-time role for them. And so finding purpose afterwards was a challenge. And then um, complex relations. And the one thing I really want to touch on with that is that one of the things parents talked about is sometimes the supports were available from the same organizations that they felt had maybe failed their child when they were dealing with addiction issues and the challenges in reaching out for support and that support was not offered to them. They had to seek it out. So with all of that, how do you begin to care for yourself and for your grief? So there were, there's five key areas that Alan Wolfelt looks at, and he talks about physical self-care. And as we talked about, grief is exhausting. And so trying to incorporate rest breaks into your day, and those might not be opportunities where you actually sleep but just taking small breaks throughout the day where you're not having to do anything and just relaxing as much as possible. If you find that you're really struggling with sleep, please reach out to your healthcare provider because we know that without sleep, it's so difficult to function day to day and to begin to process this really intense grief. Engaging in gentle exercise can be beneficial. Just a 20 minute walk once a day can really go a long ways with helping. Eating nutritious food and drinking water and really being careful of numbing your grief using things like alcohol or drugs. Cognitively, it's normal to experience disorganized or chaotic thinking when you're grieving. If there's ways you can reduce stressors in your life, if you can take some time off work, if there's responsibilities that you can step away from for a period of time, do that and try not to take on new projects when you're grieving. If you can, find opportunities to soothe your mind. You may find this in meditation, in yoga, in physical activity, but also things like knitting or gardening or creating art can be really powerful to maintain your, your mental health throughout this. Emotional self-care. Really work on paying close attention to your emotions, which can be challenging for a lot of us to do in your busy days. 
but make a point of checking in with yourself regularly and naming the feeling that you're experiencing in that moment. And if it's a feeling that needs to be addressed or expressed, take time to do that and find the words and reach out for supports if needed. It's really important to also think about triggers and grief bursts. And so triggers are um, when sometimes it's things we can anticipate are coming, whether it be a wedding we go to or a birthday or a special holiday. Um, and, and those are times where we may feel overwhelmed by our grief. And so planning ahead for those types of things when you're able uh, can be very powerful in managing your grief in those moments. And sometimes by creating a plan for how you would manage a grief burst may make it less likely that it'll actually happen because you have a plan and you know what you'll do. But if you're going to a wedding that your partner was supposed to be at with you, the wedding of your daughter, and you know that it's going to be a really difficult event for you, having a support person who's able to step away with you if need be, or knowing that you can sit in your car for a few minutes if you need to catch your breath throughout that event it can be very helpful in planning for those. Social self-care. We are naturally social beings, and sometimes when we're grieving, we may isolate ourselves. But remembering that loving relationships are a key in renewing our hope for the future. Engaging with friends and family who care about you can be a very helpful tool in grief. Just be careful not to overcommit or be cautious of over isolating. And spiritually, take a little bit of time every day, even just five minutes, to think about what gives you purpose, what allows you to feel joy. And it may be difficult to feel that right now, but maybe thinking about events in the past may help you. What allows you to feel a sense of satisfaction? And what relationships and activities are really meaningful for you, bring meaning to you? And finding time and opportunities to engage in those can help you with your spiritual self-care. And some specific things that you can do if you're um, grieving, you may want to write a thank you note. Maybe it's a thank you note to somebody who supported your person when they were struggling. Maybe calling a friend, going for a walk in nature. And if you do choose to do that, really allowing yourself to experience all the sensations that nature offers, sitting somewhere and just feeling the sun on your face or listening to the birds and the trees. Cooking something you enjoy, turning on some music, maybe a favorite song from a time that was joyful. And, and yeah, that will be mixed with sadness now as well, but let yourself access that that joy and happiness that music can sometimes connect us to. Making a memory box where you sh sh collect pictures or favorite poems um, of your person and keep that memory box somewhere where it's available to you and you look through it regularly. Some people may find helping others a very powerful thing. And I recognize that in COVID, that's a very challenging thing to try and do. But sometimes planning for the future where you might like to volunteer doing some research with different organizations if you feel that's something that might be helpful for you. Praying and meditating calm the mind. So those can be very powerful in grief. Visiting the cemetery or final resting place allows love and grief to exist at the same time. So sometimes being close to where that person, where you feel connected to them can allow both of those to be present. And doing something you've always wanted to do, especially if you've been caring intensely for someone in your life for a long period of time, thinking about something that you may have put off for a while for yourself and engaging in that. So finding hope might feel like a mountain that you have to climb when you're grieving. 
But I love what Alan Wolfelt said, which is hope is an expectation of a good that is yet to be. And just like this flower growing out of pavement, we need to nurture hope. And sometimes it shows up in unexpected ways. But we can nurture the spark of hope in our lives by spending time with people and pets that you love, taking part in activities that you really genuinely care about, engaging in spiritual practices, making future plans that you will enjoy. It's something that you aren't able to do right now because of COVID, but planning for that can bring a sense of hope, helping others, and taking care of your body, mind, heart, social connections, and your soul. And one other way that can be very powerful for families is to engage in um, awareness events like Overdose Awareness Day, which is held on August 31st and, and joining with others who are experiencing a similar grief. So we're gonna hear from Krista one last time. Uh, I've had a few people say to me that throughout this ordeal, I've shown so much strength, but I don't feel strong. I just feel like a regular person who's lost their son to a traumatic thing. And I don't want to suck it up and put on a strong face and pretend like everything's okay because everything isn't okay. My son is dead. <laughs> That's not okay with me. And uh, if you're going through the same th thing, you don't have to show strength. You can reach out and ask for help. You don't have to do everything on your own. So Krista talked about strength and it reminded me of this kintsugi bowl. And this is a practice in Japan where when bowls or cups or dishes are broken, though they're mended with gold and it's considered the art of precious scars. And these flaws or these broken bits make the piece unique and they add to the beauty of the item, but the other piece that's important to acknowledge is those parts, those intersections that are filled with gold are actually the strength of the bowl. They become part of the strongest parts of the bowl. So in this fashion, we encourage you that you embrace the changes and the broken bits that you've experienced in your grief and honor your own strength and your own beauty, despite the challenges that you've faced. So we're gonna finish by reading the Overdose Death Mourners Bill of Rights. You have the right to experience your own unique grief. Others may tell you what they, what you should or shouldn't be feeling but they have no right to do that. This is your grief. You have the right to talk about your grief. Talking about your grief, as well as the circumstances of the overdose, will help you heal. Seek out others who allow you to talk as much as you want, as often as you want about your grief. You have the right to feel a multitude of emotions. Shock, anger, fear, guilt, and relief are just a few of the emotions that you might experience as part of your grief journey. None of your feelings are wrong, but all need to be expressed. Find listeners who will accept your feelings without condition. You have the right to fight back against any shame and stigma. The stigma associated with addiction and drug overdose death is wrong. You have the right to reject shame and stand for openness, honesty, and love. You have the right to be tolerant of your physical and emotional limits. Respect your body. Respect what your body and mind are telling you. 
you have the right to experience grief bursts. Sometimes out of nowhere, a powerful surge of grief may overcome you. This can be frightening, but it is normal and natural. Find someone who understands and will let you talk it out. You have the right to embrace your spirituality. If faith and spirituality is part of your life, express it in ways that feel right to you. You have the right to search for meaning. You may find yourself asking, why did he or she die? Why this way? Why now? Some of your questions may have answers, but some may not. Watch out for the cliche responses some people may give you. Comments like it was God wills or just keep really busy are not helpful and you don't have to accept them. You have the right to treasure good memories. Happy memories are one of the best legacies that exist after the death of someone we love. And you have the right to move toward your grief and heal. Reconciling your grief, which has been complicated by circumstances of drug use and overdose, will not happen quickly. Be patient and tolerant with yourself and avoid people who are impatient and intolerant with you. Neither you nor those around you must forget that the death of the person you loved will change your life forever. So I talked a couple times about Alan Wolfelt's book, and it is quite a small book that's available for uh, less than $15 through Amazon chapters or local booksellers. It's a really great resource. That is where the Overdose um, Mourner's Bill of Rights is from, um, but lots of great information in there, and it isn't overwhelming. Another book that um, may resonate with uh, the folks who are here um, grieving the death of a child is this book by Pat uh, or Patricia Whitberger and Russ Whitberger. Uh, they um, wrote about their daughter Jenny who died of a heroin overdose and it's really a book from a mom and a, a, mom and a dad to other parents and um, it goes through um, all of these sort of um, experiences from early shock and denial all the way to um, main, meaning making and um, and sort of integrating that loss in, into your life as parents. Uh, they are also the founders of GRASP, which is grief recovery after a substance passing. Um, and it's essentially a peer support model um, out of the States. There are a few chapters here in Canada um, I believe the closest one might be Windsor um, around um, having a peer support um, grief group uh, for parents um, and families who've lost someone to a drug overdose death. Very excellent resource if you would like to pick it up from, uh, I believe Amazon does carry it. So these are references that we use throughout the presentation. And we can provide those, um, our emails are at the end if they're of any interest to you. So if you are looking for supports, your victim services, your local victim services are gonna be your quarterbacks and connecting you with supports that are available in your community. You can also reach out to your local hospice as well as contacting your primary care physician in Peterborough, they all have mental health clinicians attached to their team. If you're employed, you may have access to an employment insurance program um, and they may, may be able to support you and allowing family, friends, neighbors and co-workers to support you. Sometimes we don't want to overwhelm those around us, but they often want to show up and just don't know what's needed. One caveat I'll just add about reaching out for grief counseling, and we've said this in our prior workshops, Sheila, about really um, being able to know that you deserve good grief support and good grief counseling. And not everybody has the, uh, maybe even the understanding of grief or especially overdose grief. And so being able to choose who you wanna go see and make sure that you trust the person you're seeing and sharing your grief with, because this is important to you. 
Um, and so just being mindful that not everyone has that grief background and that you're able to uh, make sure it's a right fit for you when you do decide to go for that support. All of the videos that we use tonight are from a local resource called griefstories.org. There's a number of different topics that they cover and we encourage if you found the videos helpful to check out more videos. They have so many. What's Your Grief is run by two social workers in the States. It's a phenomenal resource as well as mygrief.ca and if you're supporting a child, kidsgrief.ca, both of which are Canadian resources. So we thank you so much for joining us. We thank you for your patience. We know your time's valuable. We are going to stop recording at this point and we will have some time for discussion if people want to stick around. I'm so sorry we haven't had a chance to address any questions that came up or conversation pieces that came up in the chat box. But if you do find uh, that you're in need of support and you don't quite know where to turn, you can reach out to Alice or myself and we can help either offer support or connect you with local supports. Alice is also, thank you Alice, brought up our evaluation poll. We just want to know if you found the information presented tonight helpful or useful. And then um, there's also an uh, opportunity to provide feedback. You can send it directly to me at Hospice Peterborough or share it in the chat box. Thank you very much for sticking with us and for coming to, uh, to our evening's uh, presentation. And if there's anyone who did select, they would like to share additional feedback in the chat, you can send it privately to Sheila or myself, or you can share it with everyone, whichever one you would like. Natalie, are you able to turn off the record function?